Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, March 30th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. This is for information and entertainment purposes only. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so I put the title of this slide in quotes, Money Fest 2024. And the reason I did is this isn't actually my um, term. I was listening to a guy that uh, I followed over the years. His name's Greg Weldon. He's uh, kind of a trader type guy. Pretty, uh, pretty switched on. And he was being interviewed on a podcast the other day, and he was talking about the what I have been talking about for a while, which is the shift in central banks to being more easy. You know, I've been talking about that for months now, and now I'm starting to see more and more people in the uh, financial blogosphere, on in twit, what have you, saying the same thing. And so he uses the term what he called because he was talking about uh, with the interviewer about how all of these hard assets seem to be breaking out. And he was attributed it to what he called money fest 2024, which is basically all these central banks now uh, slowly, but surely uh, all entering new rate cutting cycles and a new upward liquidity cycle. And so this is something that we were anticipating here at AIA I've been tracking these central bank actions for a while, since January of 2023, actually. This is the graph I made from my spreadsheet, and I'll try to explain it and show you what's happening uh, and explain why I'm very, very bullish. And then in subsequent slides, uh, this is, you know, this is basically all engines on launch. So basically what we have here is from January 2023 till March, uh, basically the data through March of this year. And basically what I have here is I've been tracking the amount of, every month I track the amount of central banks that raise rates, the amount that cut, and then the differential, right? The difference between the two. And then I have a running total, which is kind of like a advanced decline line, right? That you would see uh, in, in tracking like stocks. And, uh, So what you can see here is, is from like when I was tracking starting in January, I didn't go back further than that of last year, 2023. You see that central banks were in a raising mode. Uh, There were some banks cutting rates, obviously, you know, there's 150 plus central banks around the world. So some are going to be an easing, some, you know, but I'm trying to catch the general liquidity trend. Okay. And I think this tool has done that and it's, very interesting how some things are correlating to this. And so what I've said here is, you know, you see these raises, you saw rate raising cycle was accelerating, okay, uh, basically through the spring of last year. And you can see the amount of, this is the advanced decline, whatever you want to call it, the differential total. You saw that we had more banks cutting than, than, or more banks raising rates than cutting rates, okay? And so that was tightening liquidity. That was not conducive to uh, economic growth and things like that. Uh, Because, you know, as as I've said before, one of my main factors that goes into how my thinking goes around investing and speculating is that in the short term, liquidity, (coughs) excuse me, and sediment drive stock prices in the short term. Of course, over long periods of time, the actual business performance is what drives the stock price. But in the short, medium term, it's typically liquidity and sediment uh, in the markets. And sediment, of course, is a derivative of liquidity in many cases, right? So we've talked about that before. And so what you can see is, is that more banks, more central banks were raising rates than cutting until we got around August, okay? In August, we saw an inflection. We saw a change. We started seeing more banks cutting rates. Like if you look at September, we had more banks cutting rates than raising rates. And that was the turn, okay? And why was that? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, as as it 
the supply chains were destroyed as everybody was locked down supply was constricted we had this big impulse of inflation right of price increases supply and demand uh, exacerbated by you know governments flooding you know sending checks to people and things like that and so we had people buying stuff but not a lot of manufacturing or in the supply chain disrupted so that made sense so inflation took off and so what did the banks do they raised rates okay to try to combat that all right and so what we saw is this is why I, I, I refuse to be just U.S. centric. I'm not, you know, a homer home team bias and just focus on what happens in the U.S. The U.S. is a slowly but surely diminishing uh, part of the overall economics of the entire world. Uh, it's still significant. It's still uh, up there, number one economy, uh, how you want to look at it with GDP, but it's shrinking as a total, as a part, as a percentage of the total. And so what we saw here is in August, we saw, uh, or in September, we saw more banks in the orange here, cutting rate, uh, or we had in September, let me say this correctly, we had slightly more banks cutting. You see the differential in gray was actually negative. And so our little, uh, you know, tracker here started rolling over. And it was significant because this is just around when we started seeing some strength in the gold price and some other things around commodities. Uh, so uh, if you go back and overlay the CRB on this, you start seeing some correlation. And so this, this trend started accelerating because what happened is, you know, I started looking at countries like Brazil or Colombia and Chile, Mexico, and they were very, very quick on raising rates, uh, when their inflation problem broke out and they really stomped on inflation pretty good. And so you have a situation now where a lot of these countries really have, real interest rates that are significantly higher you know way interest rates way higher than their inflation rate and so they have a lot of room to cut rates okay and so what we saw is as the as from the summer on through the fall and into the new year we've seen an acceleration of more banks cutting rates than uh increasing rates and of course it's not just a one month inflection you want to see these things are going to be a slow, it's like turning an aircraft carrier, right? Or an oil tanker. It's a slow progression. And so what we now see is uh, like in March was tremendous. We had a significant amount of banks cutting rates uh, versus, you know, banks raising rates. So you're seeing this as this goes down, that as this goes up, it means tightening liquid, uh, liquidity. When this goes down, it means uh, loose, okay? L loosing liquidity. And it's important to recognize this, that we're starting to see the realization, I think, that a lot of the hard assets, gold, oil, uh, Bitcoin, these things are sniffing this, have sniffed this out. And now you're seeing more commentators come in, okay? And so you're going to see that narrative pick up steam, uh, something that we've been talking about for a while now, for over a year that we were anticipating, and it's finally happened. This is why... Uh, I was so bullish on emerging markets. They were in these rate cutting phases and they have a, still a lot of room to cut rates. I mean, even major economies like Canada, for example, I think their rates are around 5%. Their inflation rate is 2%. That's a really restrictive real rate of 3%. And so a lot of these countries do have the ability to cut rates. And I suggest to you that 2024 is later on as we move through the year, you're going to see the major, what I call the 800 pound gorillas of the big boy central banks, the Fed, the ECB, uh, Bank of England are going to come and start cutting rates. And then you're really going to see, and that's what I think these hard asset markets are, are you're going to have basically be in a synchronized rate cutting cycle and an upward bias in liquidity which is going to be beneficial, I think, to a lot of these uh, markets that are affected by liquidity. Could the stock market even make even higher highs? Yes, in, the, in this scenario. Uh, but I think that a lot of the um, undervalued or uh, hard assets, which tr traditionally benefit uh, from this, will, will, will do well for the remainder of the year, at least. And so we'll, we, I'm going to continue tracking this, obviously, but this is the definite trend. And again, as, as this orange or yellow line increases, that's tightening. That kind of peaked in August, and now we've rolled over, and we're definitely in a um, uh, rate-cutting cycle around the world. And so I talked about, you know, I titled this slide, the bazookas are preparing to fire. So here's the Fed funds rate. 
ECB deposit rate and the Bank of England. And so this is from um, US Global Investors charts. I make good charts over there. And here's where we are, you know, uh, this is where people we are currently, this is, you know, what's been forecasted. We haven't seen the cuts yet, but they're coming, right? And so uh, this is the anticipated forecast, I guess, of what we should be seeing. But we're definitely going to see this, okay? And the chart I pointed out last week is uh, from... Um, Oh, who, oh, from uh, Ronnie Stoifel showed that what happens when rates peak, uh, what how the gold price and gold stocks react vis-a-vis, -vis, and they go, they usually have a fairly good run. Not necessarily when, you know, it doesn't, the run doesn't start after rates get cut. It's when they've peaked, and that, that definitely peaked. So uh, we can anticipate the big guns coming out. The bazookas are getting ready to fire again. I don't really agree or it doesn't matter if I agree. It, it matters. This is why we have to listen to what these central banks are doing because they have these bazookas. And when they enter the market and they start cutting rates and liquidity goes through the roof, uh, you know, it's going to affect these asset classes. You know, and the, the interesting thing is we're very well positioned in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter to take advantage of this. A lot of the things um, that we had were kind of, hard asset base that we have are hard asset based and i believe they're going to benefit tremendously uh from from this liquidity cycle um as a matter of fact we've added we've, we're adding our third gold stock now to the portfolio uh this in this month's uh, letter that goes out should go out monday uh april 1st uh, so uh, we've already got two gold stocks in the portfolio we're adding a third and, uh, you know, this is, uh, I think, something that's going to benefit. As I said before, I think gold stocks are literally where uranium stocks were like three or four years ago. So I think there's potential there, and especially when these bazookas get fired by the big dogs. You're really going to see, you know, this is just you know, your secondary and tertiary central banks. This is the big dogs here. So and not to mention the fact that China has already printed like, $800 billion worth of um, renminbi since uh, like last year. And so they're already flooding their, flooding the market with liquidity there. So we're going to be in this globalized rate cutting cycle, which I think is going to, again, be very beneficial for hard assets. So you got to change your, you got to change your view when the facts change, right? And so uh, here's a chart from ASR Limited. I thought it was interesting. This is the probability of global recession. Um, and it's actually decreasing now. You saw the period. Um, this is basically pandemic um, and rate, rate raising cycle. And then you saw it slowly over time go down. Uh, basically, I think because of, you know, um, the rate cutting cycle we're in a new liquidity so this is uh this is very interesting that the percentage uh um probability of global recession over the next 12 months and so this is the median probability since the survey began which is 37 percent. and so a lot of people are still on this we're going to have a global recession we're not going to likely have a global recession uh again when the majority of central banks are cutting rates i don't see how you're going to have a global recession and again, the big dogs are getting ready to pull out the, the uh, I think what you're going to have is a second wave of inflation, but that's further down the road. So all is not good, though. You know, I talk about, I've talked about in the February issue of AIA, and I talked about it just in passing last week, the Cantillon effect. You know, when these central banks are cutting rates, people that have assets, people that are wealthy already are typically the ones that benefit, but yet we have the lower and middle classes are still struggling economically. And one of the indications of that is subprime auto delinquency rates. And I have heard that uh, banks, I follow people on Twitter that like sell cars and stuff. And what we have seen is we're seeing that auto uh, approval loans are uh, credit standards in auto loans are tightening. We're seeing higher delinqu delinquency rates. This is a higher rate of delinquency than during the great financial crisis, okay? 
uh, and supposedly the economy is doing well in the U.S. And I think it is for some people. It's very bifurcated, right? If you are, uh, you know, in certain industries, if you are connected to the spigot of money, the closer you are to the money printer go burr, yes, you're going to benefit tremendously. You are benefiting tremendously. But a lot of, you see a lot of people that really don't have any clue what's going on, number one. They have no idea how any of this stuff works. And they just go and they're just like, I'm exhausted. I work and I can't make any headway. And they can't. And eventually this is going, you know, because they don't have a clue what's going on. That's what I said. You've got to put a grub stake together. You've got to grind hard when you're young, when you got the ability to do it. you got to get a grub stake and you got to get in the game. Otherwise, it's like Steve Bannon said, you're going to be like a Russian surf. You're never going to own anything. You're never going to have anything. You're just going to have this life of toil for subsistence living. And you got to get in the game. And whatever you have to do, if you have to jungle up with three or four other people in one house to cut your expenses, if you've got to drive Uber Eats and DoorDash part time, whatever you got to do, if you got to shovel snow for people in your neighborhood, whatever it is, you got to you got to put the time in it and make that extra money. And you got to figure out how to make money online. Uh, since I've been able to do that, it's been life changing money. Okay, everybody has something that somebody else is willing to pay for. If you just think about it, you know, you have some kind of talent, some kind of uh, something to offer and you need to, cause then you have a global audience then. Okay. Uh, that's what, what I have here in YouTube. I mean, I've seen videos where people imagine this. I see this, these two people, the guy's kind of young, the woman's like 50 something seems to be like it has an inner tube for a belly and they go around and they have a lawn service, okay? I'm just giving you an example of what I've seen. They go once a week and find some overgrown lawn that's like some old person, a veteran, what have you, and they mow the thing for free and they film it. And their videos get five or seven million views, okay? And people watch this stuff, okay? Uh, they sit there for 45 minutes. Sometimes they, you know, interact with the neighbors. And I, neighbor, somebody will come over, a busybody or a cop will come. I mean, it's not really that exciting, but people watch this, right? And, you know, they're selling ads and those videos are worth tens of thousands of dollars. And once they're made, they're there forever. And people are going to continue to watch them. They build a fan base and they start getting into merch from a lawn service. It's like, guys, you got you to gotta think outside the box. You got to get in the game and then you have to be an asset owner. You have to own stuff, okay? Because we're getting into, we're going to be getting into a era of tremendous currency creation and we're going to be running the inflation rate at a higher level. It's not going to get back down to 2%. You know, we're going to have periods of 3 4 5% inflation that's going to compound. And if you're just a wage slave, you are going to get eaten alive. So you have to understand the Cantillon effect. You have to understand monetary policy, at least basically. You have to understand how the game is set up and played as current. It doesn't, I don't agree with it. I don't like it, but this is the way things are. And you have, like I said, if you want to, if you want to survive, if you want to thrive in this environment, it's quite possible to do that, but you have to pay attention. You have to put some work in. Okay. You can't just be somebody, you know, I was watching a video the other day. It was at a car dealership. And so the person was going around with their phone asking people at the car dealership salesmen or people that work there what kind of car they drove and what was their monthly payment and every one of these people was driving a fairly new car i don't know why and their payments were anywhere from 800 to over a thousand dollars a month who has a thousand dollar a month car payment you are not going to get ahead i mean if you yeah if you're some like guy that's making like 180 grand a year in the oil field okay that's one thing but I'm, these are like people that work at a car dealership they're not making 180 a year. This is crazy. You know, and then I hear, like I was watching a girl the other day crying online about how she's so tired. She's working and she was like putting her hand up to her head and like, you know, I don't know if it's staged or what. She's got an Apple watch on. I mean, how bad is your life? If you've, you know, you, you got you to gotta hunker down. You got to put the grub stake together. You got to jungle up with some other folks. You got to make some sacrifices. You got to have a low time preference. And, you know, you got to put some, you got to put some scratch together so you can get in the game.
because if you're not in this game, like I said, this is the future. Uh, the world has 300, and four, 300 plus trillion dollars in debt. Uh, you know, you've got 40, 40, close to 50 economies around the world with debt to GDP ratios over 100%. You have the entire Western world uh, is old and getting older and has pension and medical uh, uh, entitlement responsibilities or shall we say uh, burdens that it cannot pay all lead all roads lead to inflation folks so you need, you need to get ready for it so here we go here was a, a tweet you know this is a quote uh from powell we are not looking for inflation to go all the way down to two percent but we do need more evidence so this is what is going to happen all along okay they're not going to get to the two percent they can't they need to cut rates they need to roll and why do they need to do that because there's so much treasury debt that has to be rolled they can't they don't want to roll it at five percent okay they want to get the rates down because the interest burden alone on the federal debt is over a trillion dollars a year now and increasing okay i show in this month's uh aia newsletter in the april edition i show i took a a, a graph or a chart if you will uh, from the recent CBO, Congressional Budget Office, forecasts that are forecasting the federal debt to be over $50 trillion by 2033. It'll be over $50 trillion well before that. That assumes no inflation. They make assumptions in the further in the graph that the average interest rate is going to be 2.1%. Does anybody believe that? Unless they have financial repression and the Fed you know, lowers rates and keep, holds them down, regardless of what the inflation rate is, I don't think rates are going to be 2%. I think the 40-year, 45-year declining interest rate environment, bond bull market is over. It's been over for a couple of years. And I think rates are going to trend higher, okay? Specifically because of the levels of debt. And so the only way that they can get rid of this debt is slowly run you know, a higher than average inflation rate, keep rates lower than that. It's called financial repression. And they basically steal people's wealth via, via inflation. That's a whole nother conversation, but that that's what they want to do. They believe me, the federal reserve wants to cut rates. They're looking for an excuse. They're looking for the air cover to do it. And they're going to do it. All the central banks, the big dogs will be cutting rates later this year. So, you know, I'm not buying the hot stocks. That's not what I do. I buy things that are unloved, that have a catalyst to move higher. I buy things that are cheap. Uh, I buy things that are out of favor. I'm happy to buy growth stocks that are cheap, but a lot of things are not cheap right now. So when you get near the top of a market, um, and this is, might sound uh, totally opposite of what I said earlier, but something's going to you know, how much higher can the market go? It can go a lot higher, especially if they start these liquidity, uh, if they start cutting rates, okay? And so things can get, you know, things might be stupid now. They can get even stupider, okay? And they like will if they increase the liquidity. But this is a sign of um, when you get near a top, in my opinion. This is the kind of products that come up because the so-called investment uh, products, you know, the money management firms, the people that make these ETFs, it's all about getting assets under management and creaming fees off. So um, as they say in Vancouver about retail investors, if the, when the ducks quack, feed them. That means when they want products like this because of the greed, because of the FOMO, give it to them. So that's what they do. And so what you have here is a five times long MAG7 ETF. So here, there's a whole bunch of ETFs Leverage shares, four times long semiconductor. Leverage shares, four times short semiconductors. Leverage shares, five times long Magnificent Seven. I mean, it goes on and on. They launched a bunch of seriously leveraged ETPs today in Europe, including five times Magnificent Seven, four times semiconductors, three times artificial intelligence, and two times super micro. And so uh, this other guy says, five times long Mag7 ETF. It's almost like they do ring a bell at the top. Well, uh, I would I would agree, but I would put an asterisk there because again, if they flood this with liquidity, these things could could go up even more. Okay, 
like I said, you could really get into super bubblicious territory. Uh, and uh, we haven't, you know, this is the whole danger of why people for years have said not to have this, uh, you know, when, when, when Greenspan came in uh, in 87 and, in, you know, after long-term capital management, I think he was still there. Maybe it was Bernanke then, I don't remember. But these intrusions into the market, not letting the market clear and having the Fed come in, again, it's, you know, well, it's just a little bit. And then in the next time it's a little more, and it's a little more, and it's a little more. And then before you know it, you know, you're in, you know, you're living in Turkey with 100% inflation or Argentina with 200% inflation. It doesn't just happen in one's economic cycle. It's a process. As Adam Smith said, there's a lot of ruin in a country. And the more um, unethical, the more, uh, you know, lack of morality that these people have, you know, printing money out of thin air. I mean, you know, it it's and buying government debt to cover deficit spending, this is not prudence, okay? It's not ethical, okay? You're stealing from the future, okay? And so it doesn't matter. I'm not going to get on the soapbox because it doesn't matter what I say. It's not going to affect anything. This is what happens in declining empires. This is what happens. This is what politicians do. And the people want it. They want the spending. If they tried to balance the budget, okay, for an example, Javier Malay in Argentina balanced the budget in like one month down in Argentina, okay? And the economy is contracting even more and over 50% of the population is living in poverty. Now, they said that they wanted to go through the pain to fix everything, we'll see. Because no, I guarantee you people in the US are not gonna wanna go through the pain if you wanted to balance the budget in one fiscal year or even over two fiscal years, three or four, the pain would be tremendous. OK, look at how this deficit spending that's at wartime levels, by the way, supposedly why the economy's already doing well. If you pulled that out of there, you would have an immediate deflationary collapse. And the powers that be um, in the banking system and in Wall Street and along the whole East Coast that are in finance, they're simply not going to allow that. And if anybody actually thinks that the Federal Reserve Bank or any central bank is actually independent, you're out of your mind. And so this is what you get. You get this intense speculation, okay, at the end of these runs. But that doesn't mean, it can, <clears throat> as I said earlier, it doesn't mean it can get even more bubblicious. It likely will if they start cutting rates. And believe me, they're not just going to cut rates one or two or three times. Once they start cutting rates, the typical rate cutting cycle is 500 basis points. Okay. So you're very easily going to be down at 1% or 0% again, you know, within a year, because quite frankly, the underlying economy is not really doing as well as everybody thinks. There's certain sectors that are doing well that are the beneficiaries of this largest, but it's, it's a sick economy, right? It's a sick economy. So uh, Crescat Capital, Tavi Costa, they had a good month. They do these monthly reports. And I pulled a couple charts out of there. I thought it was really great. You know, why is the gold price going up? Central bank gold buying is over the last two years has really been the catalyst for that. Retail really hasn't come in yet. I think they will at some point. Um, Obviously, they are in some countries, but the majority of the impetus has been central bank gold buying. And so what you see here I find is interesting is um, back in the day during the last, like in the 70s, during the last inflationary cycle, central banks held 73% of their gold versus uh, international reserves, okay? Back in the day, this was the high point around 1980. This is when gold made new highs. And you saw since then when they cut rates, um, because gold doesn't really offer any rate of return, right? It doesn't offer, uh, it's just, you know, it was viewed as a, you know, non, non return, non interest bearing security. You know, they changed a lot of the rules, uh, around, you know, different in, in what central banks can consider assets. I'm not going to get into all that. That's Basel one, two, three, all that stuff. But anyways, what you see is a trend over time where gold holdings decreased at central banks, right? And the rise of 
financial uh, holdings of treasuries as a percent of government debt outstanding. So you saw treasuries being used instead of gold as uh, central bank uh, holdings. And so now what you've seen over the last several years is a bottom in gold holdings and you see central banks are slowly but surely as treasuries have been sold off, okay, over time, you're seeing gold increase. And I think this trend is going to continue for, for reasons that we've mentioned before, because of the geopolitical situation, because of the bifurcation into a multipolar world away from the Atlanticist US, Europe, Atlanticist hegemon, which is in retreat. I think you're going to see this more and more. Uh, again, the worst thing that the United States probably, one of the worst foreign policy blunders it ever made was this whole trying to confiscate or freeze Russia's, asset, Russia's assets. Regardless of what you think, it had um, ripple effects that are going to be felt for a long time. Uh, people simply do not trust the United States anymore. And, and they realize that the United States is going to do whatever it wants, whenever it's in, in, in its interest, including freezing your assets. And so why hold U.S. assets as in your central bank as your reserves where you can just buy gold? And you've done that before. Do I think that gold reserves as a uh, will get back to 73 percent in the eight like I have no idea what will happen, but it certainly can. You know, if it's around 20 percent now, it could very easily go to 35 or 40 percent. Why couldn't it do that over the next decade? OK, uh, as this number continues to come down here this number will continue to go up. And I think I just think it's fascinating, this trend to watch it and understand why it's happening. And a trend, is this trend in place and going to continue? What would reverse it? I think things are getting worse uh, in this bifurcation between the um, Atlantic hegemon and the global South and East, aka the BRICS countries, whatever you want to call it. And so a lot of those countries are saying, hey, I'm not going to hold U.S. treasuries. Again, why would I want to hold out, hold this as a reserve asset in my central bank uh, when they have this, you know, not only the risk of confiscation or getting on the offside with the U.S. government and they confiscate your assets, but what kind of assets? Who would, who would hold a, a, who would buy a 10 year treasury and hold it for 10 years? What's the thing worth after 10 years? You know, at some point, you know, you have to ask yourself that question. And at least gold can be sold anywhere in the world. Again, the trend's going to be towards more inflation, more issuance of debt. That's not positive for U.S. Treasuries, in my view, long term. Anything can happen in the short or medium term. So, again, I didn't realize how big the infrastructure spending was. Uh, according to relative to other big infrastructure spends. And this really talks a lot about um, what's happening, I think, and what the potential is to affect like commodities in the resource market. And so you go back and you look at, this is infrastructure spending today versus history. And you go back to 1956, uh, the Federal Aid Highway Act, this is when they built out the interstate highway system during the Eisenhower administration, I believe is when it started. And inflation adjusted that if that spend, which was pretty dramatic, you know, that's when they built all the interstates. And really, you know, I remember when I've lived in different places, you see these, uh, you know, four lane roads or whatever, divided highways that go through these small towns and stuff with like, you know, right Route 66, for example. Well, they replaced, once the interstates came in, everybody, the traffic off those roads because it was more convenient and expeditious to ride on the freeway, right, or on the interstate. And so that was $506 billion. It really transformed, you know, transportation in the U.S. It really kind of blew up the car culture, right, in the U.S., you know, and it had knock-on effects, I believe, for efficiency and productivity. And then you, uh, you go and look at, Global post World War II rebuild spending. This is after the biggest world war in the history of the world was 544 billion. This is the global post World War II rebuild spending, 1945 to 1953. Uh, in in today's dollars, 544 billion. Obviously, that was a big lift, right? Because after this destructive war in Europe and in Asia, 
uh, the amount of infrastructure that was destroyed that had to be replaced. Now you look at just the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, and then you throw in the Infra Inflation Reduction Act with all of the renewable stuff. It's, it's like twice both of these. And so obviously, this is going to affect uh, the, the resource markets. Why? Because they're been underinvested in. Okay, this is just in the U.S., this Inflation Inf Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That doesn't even talk about what's going on in the global south and east as these economies, uh, you know, as one acquaintance told me, the, the new fertile crescent, if you will, from Istanbul all the way through Central Asia, encompassing India, China, all the way to Jakarta is like 3.5 billion people that are increasingly become more wealthy and have a bigger and bigger demand as they get wealthier for raw materials, i.e. energy inputs, oil uranium, coal, i.e. copper for electrification, okay? Uh, Goring and Rosenzweig, I didn't put the chart up here, uh, they have a pretty good dot plot that shows um, what the required per capita copper consumption is for various um, per capita GDP levels. And if you want a step change from like, you know, $5,000 uh, per year GDP to 10000 per capita, it's a pretty significant step change in per capita copper consumption. Again, where are the copper mines? We had the chart last week. There hasn't been any really major copper mines being found, you know, except for one or two in recent years. So where's all these where's all this stuff going to come from, especially when you're throwing all this money at it? Okay. And that's just here in the US. It doesn't count again what's happening in all of these emerging and developing markets around the world. You know, you have India, for example, who has the largest population in the world, is basically at a point in its infrastructure build out where China was maybe 20 years ago. Now it won't be as quickly or as aggressive as China's build up because China's obviously a command and control economy and they have five year plans. And if the central planners in Beijing say, do this, it gets done. I mean, India is a democracy, so things are gonna take longer, but it's still happening. Modi's made tremendous you know, increases in the amount of interstate highway in India, electrification, water distribution and purification, uh, airports, ports. This is going to continue for decades, not just in India. Look at a place like Indonesia. Nobody even thinks about it. Ask yourself before I tell you this answer, short quiz. You may already know this. What's the population of Indonesia? Nobody even thinks about Indonesia. It's 300 million people. The population of the U.S. is 330 million. And so they're developing, okay? That's just one country. You take Bangladesh. It has like 150 or 180 million people. I mean, all of these countries have tremendous needs for infrastructure build out, which requires resources, which have been underinvested for over a decade. This is what this is where the potential is. This is the opportunity. And I didn't realize this. This is a really super important chart in my view, because this is like again, these were two major infrastructure initiatives. And we're almost three times that, at least double, it, almost three times. So that's going to have an effect, and that's it's going to be it's going to be inflationary. And so the other thing that they had this is a blurb from the commentary that Crescat had, which I want to get into because we've. I don't know, I don't think we understand the full implications of this either vis-a-vis -vis energy inputs and all the other inputs we're going to need. And this ref, ref, uh, refers to AI. And so let me just read this for the people on the podcast that aren't looking at the video. This is from Crescat Capital, their comments in their monthly commentary of March 2024. Global data center investment to date is about $1 trillion, according to NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wang, and is expected to double globally over the next four to five years. The Chips and Science Act has appropriated $56 billion to help with this cause, but most of the money is expected to come from industry. This amount dwarfs the current size of the semiconductor industry, which sold about $527 billion worth of chips globally last year. Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, according to a recent Wall Street Journal, Journal article, is calling for the future semiconductor industry and data center investments in the range of 5 to $7 trillion to power his AI ambitions. 
where could such capital possibly come from and how could it not be inflationary? And then one final blurb. The irony lies in the fact that the extensive infrastructure necessary to harness artificial intelligence as a significant force for reducing inflation in the long run and advancing societal productivity is more likely to increase inflationary pressures in the next five years during the required hardware expansion phase. That's just for the hardware. And so what they're saying is because so much capital is required and the supply chain is not really, supply is not where it needs to be or hasn't been built out sufficiently, that this is going to be inflationary just building out the AI infrastructure. Now you get into how do you power all of this? The power consumption needs of this stuff is like tremendous. I don't think we realize it yet. And the, I can get, it's going to be delicious kind of watching, you know, a lot of the tech bros, people that are really into AI that really want it to happen and, oh, I can't wait and blah, 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 blah. Uh, a lot of these folks are also, you know, tend to be more on the, um, you know, environmentalist side of the equation that are, I want to, don't want to use the word radical, but more sympathetic to certain theories that, uh, you know, and so where are you going to get the power? Okay. And you're going to, you've already started to see articles from some of the radical left-wing environmentalists talking about AI is just going to be, you know, the final, you know, straw that breaks the camel's back for CO2 and global warming and global catastrophe. So it's going to be delicious to watch how that gets sorted out politically but obviously this is going to you know move forward um and this is just you know it's just this is this is tremendous amount of capital that's going to be required and where is it going to come from again in a world that's you know at the at the end of what can be arguably be you know the biggest debt cycle of all time so you know um a lot of a lot of plates in the air a lot of potential uh opportunity if one gets these bets right i think and again um i don't really have to know much about ai i'm just bullish on energy you know i don't have to know much about the lack of infrastructure and how it's all going to sort itself out with all of this i just have to be bullish on energy so i think that energy as a proxy because it underpins and underlines everything okay without necessary energy inputs none of this is going to happen and you have a uh, undersupply if you will because of underinvestment and the unseriousness of many people of understanding you know uh, science and math uh, this is going to represent a tremendous opportunity and uh, so something to contemplate i really thought this was well done I, i'm really gonna have to try to get this tavi costa on and interview him he, he uh th this is really these guys are really doing really top-notch work and i thought this was an excellent uh article again it's their march 2024 i'll put a link to the um to their letter in the show notes again they have a weekly like weekly or every other week video where they talk about this stuff and it's like an hour and a half long. I, I try to catch it. And they also have uh, in-house geologists uh, and they talk about the uh, companies that they invest in. A lot of them are junior miners. They do a lot of, they've raised a lot of capital and they own a lot of stakes and a lot of junior miners. Uh, I think that they're going to do very well in this upcoming bull market. So we'll see. But uh, I thought this was very, very uh, interesting. So it all comes back to this, right? Um, and so <laughs> relative to financial assets, I mean, real assets are at an all-time low, right? Again, at the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, we sell overvaluation and buy undervaluation. So there you go. There it is. Um, I think it's ticked up recently from this. I don't know how updated this is but you get the point we've shown this chart several times in the past um this is i anticipate this going up over time could we see something like this very possibly what happened in the 70s i think i think so
or even during if you're spending you know on infrastructure at world war ii levels i mean why not you know why not this so yeah i think uh i think that's where the opportunity is so here's a tweet from Jesse Felder. This refers to a Gorin and Rosenzweig um, recent commentary. I thought it was, it's almost going to be impossible to know what's really happening in Saudi because they're so, um, you know, secretive. But um, here's the tweet. It says, since 2015, Aramco has, in fact, unexpectedly throttled back production several times. While the stated reason has been to balance the market, it may have more to do with the geological depletion than is commonly believed. And I think that's what uh, Gorin and Rosenzweig has suggested on several occasions in various articles. I'm not sure that they're wrong on that. I mean, if you, it's not unlimited supply in Saudi Arabia, you know, um, and eventually all oil fields plateau and then go into decline. And so is that a more plausible explanation than just Saudi trying to manage the market. I don't know it's it's not going to really be known in, until in, until you know a period of time goes by and then we can look in retrospect. But I think that you know if Saudi did come out and say, look, you know, we're restating our reserves downwards. We really don't have 250 billion barrels of reserves. We only have 125 billion. Um, you know, a lot of our older well fields like Garwar are now in serious de depletion and decline. I mean, the, the price of oil would go up $50 on the next day. So um, they're not going to do that. They want a stable market. So they're going to obfuscate, smoke screen. You're not going to know any, anyways. They're going to use excuses about balancing the market, things like that. Uh, but I do think that that's a, this is, a, this is a, something to at least consider thoughtfully um, because, uh, I mean, this is... Uh, it's not inexhaustible resources. Uh, so we'll see. Supposedly, uh, in the comments, somebody made of this tweet, somebody was like, well, they have tight oil there. They have all these other things. Yes, but they're more difficult to access and more expensive. So, you know, the, th the days of, you know, putting a pipe in the ground in Saudi or Kuwait and getting 25,000 barrels a day out of a well and the things under tremendous re reservoir pressure, those days are long, long gone. And so they've done a tremendous job in those places, um, you know, along with their, I'm sure, Western partners that helped them with the technology. Plus, you know, the Saudis, they've they spent a lot of time and effort doing this. I think they know what they're doing, uh, how to get the maximum production. But then again, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, it's an extractive industry. And at some point you've extracted, you can, which you extract, and then you have to move on to the less, the harder reserves to, and the more expensive reserves. And so what am I saying? You know, I think that, you know, we're getting ready to enter the summer driving season. I reported last week, for example, jet fuel demand is now exceeding pre-pandemic levels. Uh, again, you're gonna have relentless growth. These international organizations that are basically tied to the globalist agenda to trying to get rid of fossil fuels and this net zero fantasy, which won't happen. Uh, you know, don't seem to understand that all of these emerging markets it goes back to what I said earlier in this video. That it's going to be relentless demand against relentless decline. Okay. And the probably underinvestment of one to somewhere between one to one and a half trillion dollars of underinvestment over the last 10 years is going to manifest as substantially higher prices in the not too distant future. And if this is in fact true, what we're talking about in Saudi Arabia or even in Russia, you know, Russia is, you know, uh, what's going on there with sanctions. They're, they're cutting back now on uh, supply. Uh, is that a factor of, you know, the Ukrainians hitting a lot of their refineries? Uh, you know, they've got like 12 to 14% of their refining capacity offline because of Ukrainian attacks. Uh, so they have to, you know, lower the throughput of oil through those refineries. Uh, or are they having trouble ex exporting it uh, because of sanctions? Or is it a, is it part of all of this? You know, or is are they going to slowly, as Louis Gov suggested in a podcast about six months ago, as we get closer to this election, uh, would it be in Putin's interest to 
maybe cut oil at the margin, supply of oil into the market at the margin and see prices, see gasoline get up to $4 plus in the summer as we're heading into this election. I mean, that would probably be the last torpedo to break the back of the Biden administration. Okay. Uh, they shot their wad on that SPR releases, you know, a year ago. Uh, so there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of dynamics. Again, I think it's in the interest of the Russians and a lot of people in the global South and East to see a Trump administration. President Trump, uh, former President Trump has said that he will end that war in Ukraine, the, you know, within one or two days of taking office. He's just going to cut the money off and cut the support off. And of course, that would, you know, force the Ukrainians to come to a uh, make a deal with the Russians. So uh, what if what if, you know, they have a perfect excuse now. The Russians say, well, you know, our refining's down, so we've had to throttle back on production because we don't have anywhere to put the oil. And, you know, oil's fungible. You know, the, the world needs 102 million plus barrels a day. And there seems to be this view that there's all this spare capacity. But again, if you go back to what I just said in the pre in this slide about is Saudi really have the spare capacity that they advertise? I mean, I think a lot of assumptions are being made, and yet the oil prices, you know, Brent closed Friday at $87 a barrel, and we're just now going to be getting into the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, where a lot of energy, a lot of oil is going to be used. So uh, we'll see what happens. Again, uh, I think, you know, $4 plus gasoline at the pumps. I mean, I just saw it the other day in, in Texas, usually below the national average, 319 for regular. Uh, if you get up to $90, $95, $100 a barrel, uh, going into the election year, that will be front page news. And it won't be beneficial for the Biden administration. So just to keep that in mind, it's always, you know, look behind the, uh, you know, obvious and, and, and look, look at what's, uh, you know, really going on. So here we go. China's decided to up its investment budget of 2024 by 17 billion for nu uh, nuclear uh, builds outs. Uh, this is uh, according to the Shanghai Business Resource. I can't pronounce this. Yikai Global. In 2024, China uh, National Nuclear Corporation will earmark 16.9 billion dollars for investment, 50 up 52 percent compared to last year. These additional funds will be used to finance energy-related projects, including the construction of nuclear power plants. At the same time, General, China General Nuclear Power Corporation, CGN, will maintain the plan investment volume at the 2023 level, totaling $8.3 billion. These funds will be used to develop new energy sources. So we're seeing China's nuclear build-out accelerating now, more money going in. So uh, again, not a news event that will singularly affect the uranium price, but cumulative to the rest of the positive news uh, is bullish. As is this, this is the uh, announcement that the US federal government is going to uh, give uh, money to restart the Palisades nuclear station in Michigan. Um, again, by itself, probably not a big deal, but you know, brick by brick, the demand situation just keeps getting better for uranium. And again, where are when when is when are these when is the uranium supply situation going to uh you know demonstrably fix itself? Uh we're seeing a lot of producers in the US that have brownfield projects bring them back online, which is good, but that's not gonna get us where we need to go. I think I saw a spreadsheet somebody sent me with all of the announced projects that are coming back online, the U.S. gets you to maybe 5 million, slightly above 5 million pounds a year. And I think the U.S. uses 50 plus million pounds a year. So, so we got a, we got a long way to go in this bull market. And again, you know, the shiny object, nobody, you know, because I bought, hey, what happened? I bought uranium stocks when uranium was $106 a pound. And you know, I thought it was going to go up. It's not doing what I want it to do. Well, I mean, we're in a long-term bull market. Just, you know, be patient. And so this is the final thing I wanted to talk about. This happened uh, 
so I actually live in South Texas, but I work up in Houston. I have a place up there. This is on the southwest side by, uh, like, if you go down 59 from Sugarland through Rosenberg and down towards Victoria, there's a place called Needville. It's out there. They have a lot of, they built a lot of solar farms in the southwest side of Houston. And uh, evidently it was in Fort Bend County, by the way, uh, which is, a, uh, you know, extends up to the, like, almost the border of Houston. And they had a pretty big hailstorm in Fort Bend County and Brazoria County uh, last week. And this was a helicopter shot of a, oops, of flying over some of these solar farms. And I don't know if it was thousands of acres of solar panels, but it was a lot. <laughs> it was definitely in the hundreds of acres. Um, basically, a huge hailstorm came through there and just nailed these and just broke all these panels. Not every single panel, but a large majority of them. There's other, if you search on the internet, you can find even more pictures. Um, again, I, I've never understood. <laughs> I've been living in South Texas. I've lived in Houston, Corpus, Christie, down by the border where I live now, down in uh, Brownsville, Harlingen area. I, I, we get typically like today, right now, there's not a cloud in the sky. It's like 88 degrees, a little bit of wind coming out of the southeast off the ocean. Um, that's why we have a lot of wind farms, but then they've went crazy building these solar farms. We have these tremendous thunderstorms that just come up. Uh, we have these hail storms. We're in all the way from like Brownsville, all the way up through the Gulf coast of Louisiana, all the way around to Florida is a hurricane zone. We typically get hurricanes and yet people are building these solar farms. I don't get it. And my question is, is who's going to pay for this? I mean, there's insurance, I'm sure. So you'll probably have a high deductible and get paid off on your insurance and you'll, they'll order a bunch of panels and replace them. Again, what do you do with all the broken panels? That's one question. Um, I think there was some mis a lot of misinformation. People were like, oh, it's going to leak cadmium into the soil. These are like silicon based. So it's not really that. I mean, there's a manufacturer here in the U.S. that use that uses a, I think that cadmium telluride uh, mixture, but these aren't those type of panels from what I understand. And so it's just a lot of glass, aluminum. It's just a lot of junk now. And what are you going to do with this? You know, it's going to be thousands of trips to the landfill uh, with this stuff, you know. And then you have to shut the whole thing down. And do you really want your inverters and everything just sitting out there in the weeds in, in you know, humid conditions in South Texas not running? How's that going to be when you turn everything back on? And what's, what's the length of time? I know that... Uh, uh, I had to order some panels for a project uh, to finish it. And the lead times are like, um, you know, six months, you know, so, you know, and I don't even know if, and that was for a small batch. Is this going to be, this is, you know, tens of thousands of panels, right? Hundreds of thousands. I don't know. So um, the, the tweet here says a hailstorm destroys thousands of acres of solar panels in Texas. So alarmists, the plan is to build an energy infrastructure that is susceptible to extreme weather events during times of increasing extreme weather events, question mark. Is that the logic here? Question mark. Nuclear is the future, guys. That's where we're heading. This is all a slight period of five to 10 years of, you know, discombobulated thinking. In the end, we're going to end up really having a big focus on nuclear. The faster we arrive at that conclusion, the better off we'll be. Um, yes, this this is not the solution, especially along the Gulf Coast of Texas. I, I've never understood it. Again, if you're going to pay me to build ice machines in Antarctica, I'm happy to do it. If you pay me, I mean, I get you know paid well. We, we You want me to build these things, we'll build them. And so uh, I don't really have, I'm agnostic to the policy. I just shake my head because this is exactly what I expected would happen eventually and it happened pretty quick and so now you rebuild it if you do get insurance what's your insurance rates going forward they're going to be huge okay are you going to have to self-insure are you going to be out there on the risk curve what's it going to do to development and financing you know people are looking at this and going man that's going to happen to my site do I really want to be involved in this area of the country building these things this could happen to my site and then you know we saw what you know that's we don't think we know the full implications um unfortunately i don't know anybody down there on these sites that really ask inside questions but uh it's something to contemplate 
you know, I think it's funny though that with this Electroverse outfit said, you know, you know, the alarmists, climate alarmists are talking about an increase in severe weather. And so you're building infrastructure that is susceptible to being destroyed by the extreme weather that you're, you know, preaching is happening. So the solution that, to your problem is probably not this. If, you, if you're inclined to believe that, you know, CO2 is the driver of climate change. But we'll see. Again, I'm not a policymaker. I do know, why don't you take a look at the, um, there's several ETFs out there for renewables and they're all down massively, okay? Um, this all, the only thing this benefits is a lot of people in DC, lobbyists, a lot of attorneys, a lot of people that are involved in the development of this stuff and the ancillary industries around construction. I mean, the operational jobs on these farms is maybe one or two guys, if that, or they'll have a couple guys and they'll service a couple farms. So it's not this big job creation. All of the stuff is manufactured overseas for the most part. Okay, the panels, the inverters, everything. So I don't know what the real benefit of this is, except, you know, for, you know, as I've stated before, various groups to, you know, Again, there are true believers that think this is a solution, but there's a lot of grifting going on. And again, you're not going to change somebody's view on this if their livelihood depends on them not changing their view. So uh, this is this is, this will sink in because eventually they'll just say, the banks will say, wait a minute, I can't put money in this because, at least in this part of the country, because if I have another hailstorm after I replace it, I mean, how many times are we going to go through this cycle here? At some point, you know, it's not worth doing, right? So anyhow, uh, I thought this was, I want to say the word humorous because it's a lot of work that went into it. And, but, you know, again, you have to ask the question, what's the logic? So, all right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, thank you for subscribing. Again, the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, a new issue will come out on Monday, April 1st. Again, we have a new another gold stock in there. Um, and again, I think that gold, again, I want to reiterate, I have this uh, view that with all of the central bank liquidity that's get this tsunami of liquidity that's getting ready to hit the world over the next year or so, uh, six months to a year, it's really picking up steam. And again, the big dogs now, the big central banks are coming out with the bazookas and that should really supercharge things. So I think we could see, you know, 2,500, 2,800 on gold. Um, again, gold stocks really haven't moved yet. So uh, there's a potential there. I think there's an opportunity and there's definitely a longer term opportunity in this whole infrastructure around commodities and resources because of this tremendous infrastructure spending. So uh, if you're interested in understanding how I translate uh, the ideas discussed in these videos into actionable investment themes, then again, follow the link in the show notes. Uh, you can subscribe to my free newsletter that goes out every week where we get a little bit more in depth. We, do, we don't give you the exact, uh, you know, we don't give you the, the secret sauce, but we, uh, we talk more about this in depth and uh, share various videos, articles, podcasts that uh, we find interesting and uh, helpful. So avail yourself of those things. They're in the show notes. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank you for watching and we'll talk to you next week.